Here's yet another video, part seven. You grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at barrier methods and other contraceptive methods. This is part seven of a nine part video week. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Grab a piece of paper and let's dive right in. In the previous videos, we looked at contraceptive basics, oral contraceptives, transdermal and vaginal ring hormonal contraceptives, injectable contraceptives, implants, intrauterine devices. And in this video, we will look at barrier pericoital contraceptives, fertility awareness methods. This is indeed part seven. Remember our basics. Contraception is pretty much the intentional prevention of conception through various devices, sexual practices, chemicals, drugs, or surgical procedures. We did talk about the hormonal-based methods in detail in the previous videos, and in this video, we will focus largely on the non-hormonal-based methods, the ones depicted on your screen right there. In the subsequent lectures, we will look at surgical methods such as vasectomy and female sterilization. Let's begin with the barrier methods. So the first is known as the external male condom, as depicted on the right side of your screen. So remember that these are penile shafts, or sheets rather, that are going to be placed on an erect penis. And no individual fitting is actually required. And there is, this is the only reversible male contraceptive method other than the withdrawal, which has a high contraceptive failure rate. Remember, the withdrawal method does not work. I do not encourage people to use that. And the male condom is applied just before penetration and the tip should be pinched and it should be extended about one centimeter beyond the penis to collect the ejaculate. So it mustn't be completely fitting up until it's reaching the shaft where there's no reservoir in front. So ensure that you create a reservoir in front to uh, collect that ejaculate. Then remember that the penis should be withdrawn immediately after ejaculation while the condom's rim should be held firmly at the base of the penis and this precaution prevents the condom from slipping off or from spilling any semen. Remember also that the efficacy is roughly around 86 to 97 percent with the pregnancy rate at one year for external use condom being roughly around two percent with perfect use and 18 percent with typical use. In terms of the internal female condom as depicted on the right of your screen, big shout out to Kaplan Medical. Remember that this is a polyurethane pouch with an inner and an outer ring which lines the vagina and also the external genital tract. The inner ring is going to be inserted into the vagina and the outer ring is going to be covering the perineum. Remember that the inner ring is closed at the end and is much smaller, the one that's on top there on the image that's depicted on the right of your screen and is smaller compared to the outer ring and the inner ring is going to be inserted at the apex of the vagina and the outer ring remains on the outside. Remember that it's roughly about 17 centimeters long and the femidone or the female condom is going to be rarely used because it's quite expensive and it's quite inconvenient. It must not be removed for until a minimum of eight, six to eight hours after intercourse then the female condom should be uh, in place for no more than eight hours. Do not exceed eight hours uh, before the intercourse. Then they offer, often offer labial protection, unlike the male condoms, which just cover the penis. And they're also going to be protecting against sexually transmitted diseases and pelvic inflammatory disease. Remember that multiple uses can be made with washing and drying and lubrication, unlike with a condom, which is only for a single use. Then the penis should carefully be guided into the external ring and to make sure that the ejaculate is collected into the pouch. Remember also that the larger ring of the internal condom should be twisted when removing the condom to prevent any spillage of semen into the vagina. The efficacy is roughly around 79%, so pregnancy rates after one year of use of the femidone is going to be about 5% with perfect use and 21% with typical use. Here are some advantages. Remember, it's cheap with no contraindications and no side effects because generally the chemicals that were being used that cause irritation 
are no longer being used in these condoms. It's easier to carry, simple to use, and disposable. It protects against sexually transmitted diseases such as gonorrhea, chlamydia, HPV, and HIV. There is protection against pelvic inflammatory diseases. It reduces the incidence of tubal infertility and ectopic pregnancies. It also protects against cervical cell abnormalities, and it's useful where coital act is actually infrequent and irregular. Disadvantages include it may actually accidentally break off or slip off during intercourse and if it does then the patient actually needs uh, additional type of emergency contraception and it has inadequate sexual pleasure because it, there's some plastic in between it doesn't feel as good as it is going in raw and then there are some allergic reactions to the latex in some individuals then it's actually discarded after one coital act and the failure rate is roughly around 15%. The next type of barrier method is the diaphragm. Remember that this is a dome-shaped latex rubber with a firm, flexible ring, or sometimes it can be metal or spring, that fit over the cervix and the upper part, as well as the lateral walls of the vagina. Remember that they are used with a spermicide together to provide an effective barrier to sperms. Then its diameter varies from 5 to 10 centimeters, and so individual fitting is actually required. If too large of a size is used, then it can actually cause urinary retention. So remember that the distance must be measured before you fit this diaphragm, and the distance between the tip of the middle finger that's placed in the posterior fornix to the point over the finger below the pubic symphysis, this is going to give you the approximate diameter of the diaphragm that is needed because they come in different sizes. The diaphragm should be completely covering the cervix and remember as it cannot effectively prevent ascent of the uh, sperms alongside the margin of the device it has to be used together with a chemical spermicide so a spermicide must be placed on the superior surface of the device and it should be uh, during the insertion so that uh, it remains in contact with the cervix then the spermicide that's going to be applied on the diaphragm before insertion is also going to be placed in the anterior and posterior vaginal furnaces that are holding the spermicidal jelly against the cervix. And after the first episode of sexual intercourse, additional spermicides should be inserted into the vagina before each subsequent act. Then the diaphragms can be washed and they can be reused. Remember that conventional latex diaphragms are made in various sizes and they are fitted into a woman by a healthcare professional so that it's comfortable for her. Remember that after childbirth, um, the conventional diaphragms may need to be refitted because there are some changes that happen to the cervix. Remember also that a single size diaphragm, that's the single size contraception barrier device or uh, S-I-L-C-S for short, uh, is made of silicone and is going to be considered as a one-size-fits-all. It is soft and it's more durable than the traditional latex diaphragm. And the diaphragm must be inserted with the spermicide up to three hours before intercourse and should remain in place for at least six to eight hours, but not more than 24 hours after intercourse. If it's left for too long, it may result in staphylococcal aureus infection, and this may lead to toxic shock syndrome, which is quite lethal. There is an increased risk of urinary retention, as well as the efficacy being around 80 to 94%. The pregnancy rate with conventional latex diaphragm use in the first year is going to be approximately around 6% with perfect use and 12% with typical use. Then ill-fitting and accidents during intercourse actually do increase the, the failure rate as well as the pregnancy rates with the single size contraceptive barrier device of the diaphragm are similar to the conventional diaphragm. Remember that diaphragms were once used widely, about one out of three women in the 1940s were using them, but as we moved on to the 2000s, a few women actually using the diaphragms and the decline is largely attributed because we have developed more methods that are effective and easier to use for contraception. Advantages include that it's cheap, it can be used repetitively repeatedly for a long time it reduces PID and sexually transmitted infections to some extent and protects against uh, cervical uh, precancer and cancer. Disadvantages include that you do require the help of a doctor or a paramedical person to measure the size that is required. There is a risk of vaginal irritation, abrasion as well as urinary tract infection and it's not suitable for women that have uterine prolapse. On the right of the screen is an example of a cervical diaphragm. Then you have a cervical cap, which is much smaller than the diaphragm. So these ones are made up of a silicone and uh, they are going to be resembling a diaphragm, but they are smaller and much more rigid. 
The spermicide is also applied and should always be used with the cervical cap. Remember that the cervical cap is going to be inserted before intercourse. It can be inserted 15 minutes to 40 hours beforehand and should remain in place for at least six hours after intercourse, but not more than 48 hours. The pregnancy rates are about 18% with typical use in the first year, 10 to 13% with perfect use, and the rates are higher among the Paris women because of obtaining a secure fit after childbirth is actually quite difficult. The efficacy in women who have not given birth is roughly around 80 to 90 percent, while as the efficacy in women that have given birth is around 60 to 70 percent. Like I said, those changes that happen to the size of the cervix. Then the only types of the cervical caps that exist come in three sizes, small, medium and large, and the size is actually chosen based on a woman's pregnancy history. Remember that a healthcare profession must actually write a prescription before the cervical cap can be used, but this, unlike the diaphragm, does not require any custom fitting. The next is a contraceptive sponge. Remember that these ones are going to be acting as both a barrier device as well as a sp spermicidal agent. So the sponge is actually made of polyurethane impregnated with one gram of nonoxinol, 9, which is a spermicide, and this nonoxinol 9 acts as a surfactant that, that's going to be immobilizing and killing the sperms. It's going to be releasing the spermicide during intercourse and is going to be absorbing the ejaculate and it blocks the entrance of the sperm into the cervical canal. Remember that it can be inserted up to 24 hours before sexual intercourse. It should be left in place for at least 6 hours after intercourse and the maximum wear time should not exceed 30 hours. The pregnancy rates with typical use are going to be around 12% in naliparous women and 24% in parous women. And remember that nonoxinol 9 is not effective in preventing cervical gonorrhea, chlamydia, or HIV. Moreover, it does produce these lesions in that area because of the irritation that it causes, and this may actually frequently increase the risk of HIV transmission. In terms of the spermicides, remember that these can come in the form of uh, vaginal foams, gels, creams, tablets, and suppositories that are going to be containing chemical agents that act as a chemical barrier to prevent sperms by either damaging their cell membranes and thus preventing fertilization or even immobilizing these sperms. The most spermicides are going to be consisting of nonoxinol 9 or octoxinol 3 and um, benzoalkinium, and these are going to be available without prescription. They are the active ingredients of the spermicides that are going to be disrupting the sperm membrane. Therefore, this is going to be causing the possible genital irritation and ulceration in the area that can increase risk of transmission of HIV. These agents also cause sperm immobilization. Remember that the cream or jelly is introduced high in the vagina with the help of an applicator just before coitus and the foam tablets one to two are introduced in the hive high in the vagina at least five minutes prior to intercourse. Remember that they are only effective for only about one hour. So the products are actually similar in efficacy and the overall pregnancy rate is roughly around 19% with perfect use and 28% with typical or inconsistent use. Spermicides should not be placed into the vagina or rather should be placed into the vagina 10 to 30 minutes and no more than one hour before sexual intercourse and they must be reapplied before each episode of sexual intercourse. Remember that because the efficacy is limited, these spermicides are often used with other barrier methods. They're used with cervical caps, they're used with the diaphragms, they were used with condoms, but we no longer have this chemical in condoms currently. Then remember that the spermicides do not reliably protect against STIs, and also these can cause vaginal irritation, like I said, and this may increase the risk of HIV transmission, and that's why we no longer use them with condoms as a lubricant. Then we also have pH regulator contraceptive gel. So remember these ones are going to be causing changes in the vaginal pH and these changes are going to incapacitate the sperms and therefore prevents fertilization. The gels are going to be containing primarily of lactic acid as well as citric acid. Remember that the pregnancy rate is roughly around 7% with perfect use and 14% with typical use. And they must be used along with other barrier methods to improve their efficacy. Remember that these pH regulator vaginal gels should be applied in the vaginal no more than one hour before the sexual intercourse and they must be put every time you're having an episode of sexual intercourse thereafter. It does not reliably protect against sexually transmitted infections. Then we'll move on to the fertility-based or fertility awareness-based methods, which 
were previously referred to as the natural methods. Remember that these ones are going to be involving things like tracking your menstrual cycle and physiological changes that often occur during the menstrual cycle, such as changes in the cervical mucus to estimate when a woman is likely to ovulate. And so therefore you can actually avoid the days before, the days during and the days after ovulation so that you prevent pregnancy. Remember that this is going to also require the partner's cooperation. So if you have an uncooperative partner that just wants to have intercourse at any time, then these methods will not work. And the woman should also know her cycle and should know the times when she's actually fertile. So for those that have irregular cycles, this will not work. It needs someone to have regular cycles. And remember that these fertility awareness-based methods are going to include natural contraception, which are going to include the rhythm methods, quintus interruptus, and lactational amenorrhea barrier methods which we've talked about the condoms diaphragms and spermicides and although the ovum can actually be fertilized for only about 12 hours after ovulation remember the sperm can actually live in the female genital tract for up to five days and as a result the intercourse that's occurring five days even before ovulation can result in pregnancy and then remember that these fertility-based awareness methods are going to be requiring abstinence from sex starting from five days before ovulation. And the failure rates of these natural methods of family planning are actually quite high, largely because the couples find it quite difficult to abstain from sexual intercourse whenever they are required to. So we'll begin with the rhythm method. Remember that this is the only method that's going to be approved by the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. It's going to be based on identification of the fertile period of the cycle to obtain um, to abstain rather from sexual intercourse during that period. So it also does require some partner's cooperation and remember several methods can be used to identify the time when this woman is ovulating and therefore to determine when abstinence is actually required. So there are ways to do this. You can use the standard days or the calendar method based on the previous 12 menstrual cycles. You can also use the two-day ovulation or mucus method which is based on evaluation of the cervical mucus. You can use the symptom uh, symptothermal methods, which are going to be used the combination of the basal body temperature, evaluation of the cervical mucus, as well as abstinence during the fertile period. So advantages of the fertility awareness methods is they are, there's no cost that you're going to incur and they lack any side effects. Disadvantages is it's quite difficult to calculate the safe periods reliably. It needs the several months of training to use these methods and the compulsory abstinence from sexual act during a certain period. It's not applicable during lactation or amenorrhea or when the periods are actually irregular. So we'll start with the standard method uh, or the standard days method or the calendar method. So remember that this one here is based on the calendar, the dates that the menses actually occurred and is appropriate for women that have regular menses. So remember the calculation is based on the 12 previous menstrual cycles and the first uh, unsafe day is going to be obtained by subtracting 20 from the length of the shortest cycle. Then you are going to subtract 10 from the length of the longest cycle. So you subtract 20 from the shortest cycle and 10 from the longest cycle. And ovulation is going to be occurring 14 days before the onset of the menses. Remember, here's an example. If someone has cycles that are ranging, the shorter cycle being 12 or 20 seven days and the longest cycle being 29 days. So it means that if you subtract 20 from 27, it gives you seven days. If you subtract 10 from 29, it gives you 19 days. So it means that this uh, or gives you 19. So it means that from days number seven to day number 19, this person, always consi this person is considered fertile and they must avoid sexual intercourse and during this period. And remember that the greater the variance in the cycle length, the longer the abstinence is required. The cycle beats can actually be used where you have a string of color-coded beats that represent the days of the menstrual cycle or other tools like digital menstrual cycle trackers, which are these various apps that people are using now, can be used to help a woman keep track of her fertile days. Then with the two-day method, remember that the two-day method is going to be consisting of the cervical mucus assessment. So the cervical mucus actually may become absent for a few days after the menses and then afterwards it may reappear. It may become cloudy, thick and inelastic and shortly before ovulation the amount of mucus actually is going to increase. The mucus becomes thin, much more clear and much more elastic. It actually looks like an egg white and you can actually stretch it in between your fingers. So the woman will often wash her hands, place her hands around the cervix and actually look at the consistency of the cervical mucus. 
mucus. And remember that intercourse is avoided completely during the menses because the mucus cannot be checked at this particular time. And it's going to be permitted during the days when the mucus is completely absent. But during the days when the intercourse is restricted, um, it's going to be restricted to every other day so that the semen is not really confused with mucus. And the intercourse is going to be avoided during the time when the mucus first appears after the menses until four days after the amount peaks. And then the intercourse is permitted without restriction from the four days after the amount of the mucus peaks until the menstrual, um, the menstruation actually begin again. Remember that a change in cervical mucus indicates ovulation and is actually much more accurate than body temperature. Then with the symptothermal methods, remember that this one are going to combine the daily measurement of the basal body temperature, which often includes increases during ovulation by 0.2 to 0.5 degrees. There are often graphs that can be used to actually plot the, the basal body temperature. And cervical assessment as well as the standard days method can be used. This actually gives you a better chance of actually telling when you are fertile. Remember that intercourse is going to be avoided from the first day, requiring abstinence according to the standard uh, days method until three days after the amount of cervical mucus decreases and the temperature increases. And this is going to be telling you the period where you're fertile and when you can actually have sexual intercourse. Remember that this method has a lower pregnancy rate with perfect use than the two-cycle method or the standard days method with or without use of the cycle beats. However, the pregnancy rates with any of these methods are higher compared to the other contraceptive methods. So these methods are not recommended for women who want to strongly avoid getting pregnant. And here is a um, comparison of the fertility awareness based methods of contraception especially in the usa so the pregnancy rates in the first year with perfect use and those with typical use for the standard days it's five percent for uh, the perfect use 12 percent for typical use for the two-day method is four percent for the perfect use 14 percent for the typical use for the symptothermal it's less than one percent for the perfect use and two percent for the typical use then we'll move on to coitus interruptus, which is the withdrawal method or what the streets call the pull-out method. So this is the oldest and probably the most widely accepted contraceptive method used by men, but it rarely works. So it involves the withdrawal of the penis shortly before ejaculation and it's going to be requiring this sufficient self-control by the men so that the withdrawal of the penis precedes ejaculation. Remember that it has a high failure rate of 27% as uh, you may have this pericoital secretions that may contain sperms. Advantages inquire there is no appliance that is required. There is no cost. It's absolutely free. Disadvantages is that it requires a high amount of self-control and the woman may develop anxiety, neurosis, vagin vaginismus or pelvic congestion and their chances of pregnancy are more, especially if there are precoital pre secretions that contain sperms, as well as if there's an accidental chance of the sperm being um, deposited into the vagina. Then we'll move on to lactational amenorrhea. Remember that this is a method that's going to be based on the natural postpartum infertility that occurs with a woman that is going to be exclusively breastfeeding or almost exclusively breastfeeding a child in whom the menses have not yet resumed. Remember that the infant suckling is going to be inhibiting the release of hormones, the gonadotrophins and luteinizing hormone, which are going to be preventing ovulation. And without ovulation, pregnancy cannot occur. Then there has been also some literature that has suggested that the hyperprolactinemia is going to be inhibiting the menstrual cycle directly by having a suppressive effect on the ovary or indirectly decreasing the release of gonadotrophin releasing hormone. The method can actually be 98% effective if the woman actually meets all these criteria. They must meet all these criteria. So number one, the infant must be less than six months. Number two, the breastfeeding should be the primary source of infant feeding. So supplementation with formula or solid foods or pumping breast milk decreases the efficacy of the method. And of course, the breastfeeding is done at least every four hours during the day and every six hours at night. The menses should not have returned. This, mens this woman should be amenoric. Remember that the risk of pregnancy to a woman who is fully breastfeeding or and amenorrheic is less than two percent in the first six months and otherwise the failure rate is high about one to ten percent so during the breastfeeding additional contraception must be used if they do have sexual intercourse such as condoms intrauterine copper devices injectable steroids we must 
advise a woman to use those women, these methods if they are not falling under the criteria that I've just mentioned above. And remember, when a woman is fully breastfeeding, a contraceptive method should be used in the third postpartum month. And with partial or no breastfeeding, we must use this in the third week postpartum. I really hope you enjoy this lecture on the fertility-based awareness methods. If you did, consider subscribing to this channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.